It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. From the CBS television news staff, Larry Lasseur and Lou Chaffee. Our distinguished guest for this evening is General James A. Van Fleet. First time I ever saw you, General, I guess, was crossing the English Channel uh, 10 years ago. Yes, Larry, those were great days. I wonder if you mind telling us, General, just what happened to you after you uh, landed in Normandy and then when you left the 8th Infantry Division. Well, Larry, after the fall of Cherbourg, I moved on to the 2nd Division. Stayed with that for three months, then took command of the, in turn, the 4th Division and the 90th Division, two great divisions. Following that, I became a Corps Commander and finally wound up in Southeast Germany under General Patton. Well, uh, we've had a lot of promotions, General. I'm still a correspondent. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then when did you go to Greece, sir? Well, after I came home, then I was ordered to Greece to be the military advisor to the Greek government. And after that? Well, came home again and then back to Korea. Well, General, this is like an old family reunion because you and I met in Korea. Yes, I remember, Lou. After you, Larry. Uh, General, there's one question I wanted to ask you. Uh, did you ever think while you were over there as 8th Army Commander that there was a possibility we could have won the war? Well, of course, Lou, I said that many times and I still believe it. Well, uh, how do you think it could have been done? Well, by defeating the Chinese Red Army inside of Korea. The objective there was the Red Army, not terrain or the Yalu River, but a humiliating defeat of the Red Army well south into Korea. Well, how exactly could that have been accomplished, General Van Fleet? Could well, many ways, many ways by uh, just killing a great many of them. Well, I wonder if you'd care to uh, just tell us a few of those tactics which you might have considered at that time. Well, many ways, of course. Uh, you could execute some end runs, landings. You could draw them south. You could cause them to attack you. And then with counterattack, mainly with fire, destroy great numbers of them. Well, did you notice any uh, particular rigidity in the methods that the uh, Chinese communists used in fighting? General? Yes. Yes, they, uh, they didn't like to lose a position. They would lose face and uh, their commanders uh, above them would demand that the hill be retaken. How and in the retaking of it, they'd lose great numbers. So if you just kept taking hills away from them, they could keep them coming into you, you think? There, there's a, a battle for about three or four weeks, and after that, it's a fluid situation. Well, how about the individual uh, communist soldier? Well, he's a good soldier. Don't, don't sell the Asiatic short. He's a great soldier. Well, General, what was your opinion of our uh, greatest lesson in Korea? What did we learn most from the uh, three years of war there? Well, I think we learned that uh, the Asiatic is, is a good soldier, especially the Korean and the Chinese. And the development of a native army like the Korean army was one of our greatest accomplishments in Korea. Well, do you think you learned anything in Korea that uh, you hadn't exactly learned fully in Greece? Yes, we, yes, we learned a great deal. And that uh, you can form an army out of the illiterate uh, Asiatics, is that? Oh, oh yes, he's a superb individual. He has everything that it takes to make a good soldier. He has stamina, he's unspoiled, he'll do exactly as he's told, he's intelligent, he learns fast, he's brave, he obeys, he'll go forward and die. You can't ask more of any man in battle. Would that be a good description of the Rock Army as it stands today? That is, yes. Well, General, in the current issue of Reader's Digest, uh, you say that uh, the free world is losing the uh, war in Indochina right now. Now, from the background of your experience, is there anything we could do to uh, secure this uh, vitally strategic area? Well, Larry, uh, of course, that's the article I have in the Reader's Digest for February. Yes. I say that uh, we sh should support worthy allies, and a worthy ally is one which will fight for its freedom. We found the Korean would do that under Sigmund Rhee. And I believe we can develop worthy allies elsewhere in the world. 
Well, how do you suppose we get the Chinese into make Indo-Chinese and make them into uh, worthy allies? I mean, are they fighting for Indochina or not? Sir? Well, of course, we need a Sigmund Rhee in Indochina. We have a Sigmund Rhee in the person of Chiang Kai-shek in Formosa. Now, I'd like to ask you about Chiang Kai-shek. We've uh, just shipped these 21,000 uh, reluctant uh, prisoners of war, the chaps who wouldn't go back to communism. Now, do you think that this army we're supporting in Formosa now under Chiang Kai-shek is a drain on the American taxpayer, or do you think it serves some valuable purpose, General? Oh, they're worth their weight in American boys. They, they cost very little. We get 21 divisions for a, for a very small price, for the price of one American division. Do you think there will ever be a purpose for those people there, or, or just to divert a... Uh, a communist army away from other areas. They have a tremendous pressure on the mainland of China. Yes. Right now. And should, and the day may come when we'd like to have a ready army to take advantage of some opportunity. Mm. Have you seen uh, Chiang Kai-shek's army? Do you know uh, how good it is? I was fortunate to see a good part of that army last summer. Yes. Mm -hmm. a, a splendid army, a very high morale, a dedicated army. Good for many years veterans. Well, General, I'd like to ask you a personal question, sir. I was just looking over my files on, uh, today and I noted that on April 2nd, 1952, your son was reported missing in action. And now that the prisoner question has been solved, we think. Have you heard anything about him? No, Larry. Unfortunately, we had no information that we could rely on. Many rumors, but not substantiated. Well, about those prisoners, General, to get off that subject for a second. Uh, these 21 boys who refused to come back and have now gone back beyond the bamboo curtain. Uh, what do you think we should do about them, if anything? Well, Lou, they're to be pitied. They're unfortunates. I think the best thing is just to forget them, write them off as lost boys. Perhaps many of them were communists or inclined before they went into the, the army. And others of them, uh, no doubt, were cowards on the battlefield. Maybe they can't come back because of that record. Let's forget them. General, in your recent trip around the world, uh, you inspected some highly strategic areas and highly uh, vital ones, too. Now, everybody knows that Russia covets the oil of Iran. Do you think there's anything we could do to make Iran into a defensible region? Oh, yes. Unfortunately, the whole Middle East is a void. They need our help to build up their defense forces so that the country will have confidence in staying free. They will fight. They don't ask for a single American boy. But they do ask for tools and training under American supervision. Well, how about Turkey? The same for Turkey. Of course, we've had a mission there and some help for some time. Well, uh, General, uh, did you drop in on your old stamping grounds in Greece on this trip around the world? Yes, I'm very happy to go back there and see a wonderful Greek army, still highly trained, tested in battle, and as fit today as when I left it in 1950. Well, what do you think, uh, sir, is the formula for uh, creating a, a spirit such as that? Larry, that's what I point out in my article in Reader's Digest. First of all is the uh, spirit of the country to fight for its freedom. And I call that a worthy ally. If they will fight for their freedom, let's help them. And, they, and we will not have to send any American boys to that part of the world. Well, what makes a country want to fight for its freedom, General? I do uh, Love of liberty, family circle, pride of race, pride of nation, pride of, their, of themselves, maybe their religion, righteousness. And confidence, I suppose, in their men in arms. You think it takes hard training to give them that confidence, too? Not too much training. They learn fast. They work hard. But they do need the guns. They need the guns and uh, not too many expensive weapons either. But General, how on a could very we austere but adequate basis. How could we prevent a country in which we have armed and uh, which is a worthy ally from uh, conducting our foreign policy perhaps and uh, going to war when we didn't want them to go to war and drawing us into a battle which we didn't want to go into? Well, I think that's the kind of... A a leader we want in those countries will show determination to fight for their freedom, make effective use of the aid we give them. But of course, to be allied with us and not do anything rash to bring on uh, an act of war of their own volition. 
not be the aggressor, but to fight back strongly if they are attacked. Now, General, uh, there seems to be a new defense policy abroad in this land, one which uh, lays emphasis on air power and uh, what is called instantaneous or instant retaliation rather than local ground defense. Now, does this fit in with your own concept as one of our great ground warfare generals? Yes, it does. Of course, we are preparing for the uh, World War III or atomic war, which we hope will never come. But during that time, we must do something to win the Cold War, the war that is actually being waged and which we have been losing for many years. That's the war that we must prepare more for. And that war must be won by native armies already on the spot. Well, one question about back to Korea again, General. Do you think Sigmund Rhee will uh, precipitate another war. Do you think he'll uh, disobey the UN and start the war? No, over certainly again? not. Sigmund Rhee has uh, cooperated with us fully up to now. I believe he will continue to be our finest ally. Well, General, as a final question, may I ask you, uh, what role do you think uh, our own United States should play in what seems to be a permanent uh, struggle with world communism? Well, first I would say to train and arm worthy allies. Second, to give them the ammunition they will then need in case they are attacked. And third, to keep America strong for the greatest strike of all, the counteroffensive with atomic weapons. Well, do you actually think we should have uh, any soldiers overseas? None at all. No American ground soldiers at all overseas, except in a few of the protected bases, naval and air bases. And you think, therefore, by training and uh, giving these people a, something to fight for, that they will become the allies, which would make it unnecessary for us to risk our men? We can bring our places. ground armies home uh, rapidly, as soon as we replace them with native armies. Well, thank you very much, General. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Nice it's been fine to have you here tonight. tonight. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was... Larry LeSeur and Lou Chaffee. Our distinguished guest was General James A. Van Fleet. To watchmakers of the old school, such as Longines, pride of workmanship is evident in every detail of every operation. In a watch, in truth, the smallest cog is just as important as the biggest wheel. Pride of workmanship made Longines the world's most honored watch. Honored at World's Fairs by 10 grand prizes and 28 gold medals. Honored by government observatories with countless prizes and citations for accuracy. Honored as official watch by sports and contest associations the world over. Now for all who have an appreciation of the fine and the beautiful, the pride of workmanship so evident in every Longines watch makes an irresistible appeal. Our particular message at this time is an important one. If you wish to buy and own, or proudly give just about the finest watch made anywhere in all the world, your choice might well be Longines, the world's most honored watch. Priced as low as $71.50. And regardless of the price you pay for your watch, it's made with that pride of workmanship which has made Longines the world's most honored watch. The world's most honored gift. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. <laughs>